Good morning. Good morning. Sometimes I start to wonder whether this day was actually ever going to come. That was a long journey, but we are so glad to be here. And we are so thankful to God for you. Appreciate your encouragement, your prayers. Uh, that whole pile of food some people left at our front porch yesterday was pretty awesome. Uh, the help unloading and just so much encouragement. So thankful for this tree. So thankful for the opportunity. So thankful for how you're loving my family. And we're ready to get at it. So we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 10. So I encourage you to open your Bibles there if you would to Luke chapter 10. The title of the lesson this morning is The Third List. We're in a time that I don't, I know we've talked about it in different ways, whether it's Bible studies on Monday or text talks or sermons. We're in a, I don't need to say it, a very tense time, aren't we? There's a lot of emotions that are running up. A lot of times that maybe we say things that we shouldn't say to each other, think things that we shouldn't think, because we're so passionate about maybe this is what we believe. And so this lesson is not about whether we have strong stands or whether or not we speak up, because even Paul spoke up, didn't he? This lesson is about the heart of us as Christians and how we do things and how we respond to each other. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. Some of you may be familiar with that. Maybe this would be the first time you've ever heard this parable. We call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. But we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 10. And so again, so excited to be here and to be doing this together. And so if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to see me. I'll direct it all to Max. <laughs> all right. What we're going to do first is we're going to read Luke 10, verse 25 through 37. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. A lawyer would be an expert in the law of Moses. Maybe not how you see attorney today. And saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, important phrase here, desiring to what? Desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, he tells a story. Jesus often did that to teach, didn't he? We call them parables. You put two concepts side by side. He's teaching a concept here by a story. He's going to interpret this question, answer this question, who's my neighbor, by telling a story. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, notice the verbs, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now that's an awesome story with an incredible lesson, isn't it? And so we're going to look at some, some thoughts about this today. The lawyer put him to the test. So as we consider this concept, it's okay to ask God questions. It's okay to ask Jesus questions. People asked, I think it's a good study to go through the Gospels and just look at the questions Jesus asked and then flip that around. And look at the questions people asked Jesus. There's nothing wrong to ask 
questions. It's the heart of, uh, that's revealed when we ask the questions, isn't it? And so what, what happens here, <clears throat> uh, you can see in Luke chapter 1, we're not going to turn there, but you have Zacharias who was promised a child by Gabriel and Mary who was promised a child by Gabriel, and they both, that, both asked a question. One wanted, it, one wanted proof. He wanted proof. Zacharias didn't believe, and he wanted proof. That's how his question came out. Mary's question was one of process. She believed, she just didn't know how it was going to happen. Their hearts were revealed when they asked the question. We see people that came to Jesus like this, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And their hearts are revealed. They didn't really want to know because there were things in their heart they didn't want to give up. But then there were other people who asked questions like the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, what shall I do to be saved? He was asking a question, but he really wanted to know, didn't he? So asking questions is not bad, is it? But our hearts are going to be revealed when we ask the question. And so the lawyer's uh, question in Luke 10 wasn't about learning. You ever asked a question and maybe you didn't even want to know? You're just maybe being cocky? Anybody ever be co here cocky? <laughs> and sometimes we just, uh, if you own chickens, you really understand that, what that means. <laughs> but it, maybe I'm asking a question and it has nothing to do with information. And that's exactly what we see here. These people didn't. They knew it. They knew what the two greatest commands were. This wasn't about information. So we're going to talk more about that. There's, like I said, there's a difference between asking questions and testing God. And the Jewish leadership knew the two greatest commandments. I want to show that to you. You'll turn with me to Mark chapter 12, please. Mark chapter 12. You know what I'd love to have is a page-turning app, so like when you're turning pages on your phone. I can just, just kidding. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 34. 20, uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. <clears throat> Notice this scribe, this teacher, this person who knew the law, knew the two greatest commands. And this is demonstrated by the, the man we already saw in Luke 10, and it's demonstrated here in Mark chapter 12. One of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, quoting from Deuteronomy, the same way the other guy did. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Apparently, this was well settled among them all as the two greatest commandments. They knew it. We'll continue. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You've got the foundation. You're not far from the kingdom of God. And then it says after that, no one dared to ask him any, any more questions. That's kind of what Jesus did to people when they talked for a while. He ended up silencing them somehow. So it wasn't about information. They knew God's greatest commands. They didn't keep it. I want to look at a couple examples of that. Matthew chapter 23, if you would. Matthew chapter 23. You could read the whole chapter when you see what Jesus said about the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish leadership, but we're not going to do that. We just want to look at the first four verses of Matthew 23. The reason I'm doing all this because haven't you known better, but you did differently? Isn't that all of us? You knew better. You knew what the word said. You did something completely different, didn't you? I knew what the word said about having a, a, a soft and kind word, and I did differently. We've all done that. So a lot of times our problem isn't knowledge, is it? In fact, Paul says, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. 1 Corinthians 8. Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe what they tell you. 
Did you hear that? But not the works that they do, for they preach but do not practice. How many of you would want that said about you? We do one thing on Sunday, but Thursday night, I'm a different person. Is that what you want Jesus to say about us? No, not at all. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Jesus tells them in John chapter 7 and verse 19, and I'll make these notes available. You can have these. But John chapter 7 and verse 19, he says, none of you keep the law. You have it, but you don't keep it. And Stephen, in Acts chapter 7 and verse 53, if you're taking notes, right before he's about to die, he preaches this incredible sermon. He convicts them, and he says, you have received the law by the direction of angels, and what? You have not kept it. So what I'm trying to get at is, is a lot of times Aaron's problem isn't information. We do need to study, but there's things I already know that I'm not doing, right? So we have to think about this. So we continue. The lawyer was seeking to justify himself. When I started to uh, write this sermon, I said his purpose was twofold, was to make himself look good and test Jesus. But I changed my mind and just said his purpose was onefold, was to make himself look good. Testing Jesus was a part of making himself look good. That's my conclusion. And I could be wrong on that, but that's my conclusion. Testing Jesus was a part of making himself look good. That's painful. Maybe if we look in the mirror and we really think about this, am I, am I really trying to do what God says or am I just trying to make myself look good? Am I really listening to what the word says or do I kind of want to change it around to make me feel better? You ever done that? I really want that verse to say something different because I'm reading it and I don't feel very good right now because it's convicting me. So maybe I'm gonna change it around. Well, that's what he's doing. So let's get back to, uh, well, as we look at Luke chapter 18, which is on the, the screen here. Jesus told a parable in Luke 18 about two men who went to the temple to pray. But he told the parable because he says that there were some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. But notice this. This is where we're going to get to this idea of the third list. The third list. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, but how did they treat others? With contempt. Contempt. They had love God, love your neighbor. Anybody I don't want to treat nice is on my third list. But does that not apply to you and me? They, when, when we can trust that we are so right and trust that we are, our, our stand is so morally right, we got to be careful, don't we? We got to be very careful that we don't treat others with contempt in how we come across to them as we talk. And so we need to remember that ourselves. And so what I wanna do here, uh, I know Chris Emerson was here and I, years ago I met him and I was at a men's retreat in, uh, near Houston years ago and I heard him talk about the inductive study Bible. So I have one here. <laughs> and I love that concept, the inductive study method, which scholars came up with that, but I wanna show you that Jesus used it right here in Luke 10, okay? So we're going to look at these three. I want to put them on the screen. Observation, what does the text say? Interpretation, what does the text mean? Application, how do I use it? Observation, interpretation, application. I can't apply what I haven't interpreted properly, and I can't interpret properly what I haven't read. Think about how sometimes we, maybe a, a book like Revelation, we can kind of mess ourselves up on that because we hadn't read it. So we got to read it, and that's what Jesus does with him. Let's go back and look at the a text of Luke chapter 10 and show that Jesus uses this method with him. He's like, verse 25, the lawyer says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, observation, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Well, he got number one right. And I think a lot of Christians, we get number one right. We've read it. But now we're getting into interpretation. Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Bible says that he's seeking to justify himself, says, who's my neighbor? I'm going to get out of this one. I'm going to find a way to create a third list so that I don't have to love these people that I'm disgusted by. So he wanted to create 
a third list. And so Jesus is telling a story to interpret the question, who is my neighbor? You're reading the text. Now he's going to tell this story. And so he tells a story about four people. One's beat up. He's laying there by the side of the road. I like the picture on the, uh, the PowerPoint because it's kind of more of a modern. It's got us in our nice suits walking by because that's what you have this priest who is supposed to be the person standing in between the people and God. If there's anybody who should have been an example of God's mercy, love, and compassion, it should have been the priest. And so he's, he is walking right by this person. The second is the Levite. The Levite, I believe, are the support staff for the priest. They do the same thing. He walks right by him. And then you have the Samaritan. Now, if you're taking notes, I don't, this is not on the outline, but 2 Kings 17, you can study this later, but that tells you the history of the Samaritans, where they came from. The Assyrians came and conquered Israel, pulled them out of their land, left some Israelites remaining, and brought in other nations. And they intermarried. And you have half Jew, half Gentile, half following God, half idolatrous people. And that's what remained in Samaria. That's the Samaritans. And the Jews in Jesus' day absolutely despised them. And Jesus picks a Samaritan to show that this law is fulfilled by him, the person you're disgusted by. The Samaritan. In, what does it mean to be a neighbor? What did Jesus tell by the story? Again, look at all of those verbs. He had compassion. Verse 34, he went to him and bound up his wounds. He poured on oil and wine and he took care of him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, took care of him, took out two denarii and says, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm with this guy for the long haul. Take care of him and any, anything else, I'll pay you back. Who's the neighbor? Samaritan was the neighbor, wasn't he? And so we have the interpretation of it, and now we have the application. And he asked him a question, which of these three was neighbor to that person? This lawyer, with all his lawyering, could not get out of that question, could he? And that's the, that's the beauty of Jesus and how he's the master teacher. He just pierced right through him, didn't he? Which one of these three was the neighbor? Well, the one who showed mercy. Exactly. What's the third point? Application. You know what the text says. You know what the word just said. And I, and I have just explained to you what it means. Now, what's your job? It's to live it. So how do we apply that to our life? And so we continue. The third list is, first list, love God. That list is pretty short, isn't it? God. He's on the first list. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That means with every part of you, you love God. That's from the book of Deuteronomy. Second list, anybody not on the first list is on the second list, isn't it? That's how it works. There's no third list. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody who is not God is your neighbor. And yes, there are times that we have to, like, and again, in a church, we may have to discipline. Maybe as a, as a parent, I'll have to discipline. As a society, we may have to discipline. That's loving your neighbor, by the way. But we have to understand this, that I, I can't put anybody on a third list. And how I think about them, how I talk about them, how I treat them, even when we disagree, even when I believe you're absolutely upside down in your thinking. Because you are. I'm right. You're wrong, right? I'm joking. <laughs> Anyone other than God is your neighbor. I, I was just thinking about this for myself, and you may have things you think about, and you could add this and tell me later. I started to think about all the people that were on the Jews, the Jewish leadership's third list. They were very loving amongst their group, weren't they? They, they were very loving and supportive of their own group, but I tell you what, if you were a woman, a Gentile, a Samaritan, a Roman, a tax collector, a harlot, a sinner, a leper, a widow. <laughs> Should I go on? Yeah, Jesus, if you were Jesus, if you were his disciples, if you were John the Baptist, if you were his disciples. The people who followed other religions. This is all on the outline, by the way. How about people who disagreed with them? How do you handle it when somebody disagrees with you? You're on the third list, baby. What about if it's somebody that, that, that threatened them, threatened their status, threatened their power? You know, somebody whose sins absolutely disgusted them, like Luke 7 with that sinful woman. Third list. And as I think about that, have I created one myself? 
I don't, I don't want to go there, honestly. But we have to go there. Have I created a third list for me? Have you created a third list for you? Do we need to think about that, brothers and sisters? Who's on my third list? Maybe I want to know who to put on that third list so I can be justified in not treating them in a kind way. Which is exactly what the scribes and Pharisees were doing with all of those people that they deemed unworthy of their love. So who's on my third list? How about people who disagree with me politically? How about those who just disagree with me in general? You see this at work, don't you? Somebody disagrees with a plan, of course, at work, and somebody goes ballistic. Well, you just created a third list whether you like it or not. Somebody at your home and your marriage says something you don't like, and you go off on them. Whether you like it or not, you just created a third list. I am justified in not treating you in a kind way because of. Have we done that? How about people who make you uncomfortable? And that could be a broad range. How about people who are different than you? How about people who challenge your beliefs? How about those whose sins absolutely disgust me? How about those who have nothing they can do for us? I want you to turn with me to James chapter two, please. James chapter two. The church that James is writing to had a third list. And he talks about loving your neighbor as yourself in this context. And that's why I want to bring it up because they didn't realize they were doing the same thing that the scribes and Pharisees and lawyers were doing. And it had to do with who had the nice clothes and had the money and who didn't have the nice clothes and the money. Like, wait a minute, you just created a third list. James chapter two, verse one. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stink, <laughs> right? You stay over there. You stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions, third list, among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, here it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you see that? You just divided it. Third column. If you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. He can't say it any more plain, can he? If I treat brother A better than sister B, I've committed par sin. Partiality. And I'm convicted by the law as a transgressor. Whoever keeps the whole law but falls on one point has become guilty of all of it. Verse 12, uh, verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Another verse where Jesus says in Matthew 25 and verse 40. Matthew 25 and verse 40, he says, if you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. He just took one and two, put those lists together. You treat God one way. You can't treat God one way and his children the other. We understand that? But have I done that? I've done that. Have you done that? So let's think about these thoughts. As we go to the cross, did not Jesus at the cross, we're about to take of the communion here in a little bit. As we get ready to take of the communion, and think about the blood that Jesus shed. Did he not hanging from that cross show us there's no third list? Didn't he show you that and show me that, that the people that were murdering him as they are driving nails into his wrists and they are mocking him and spitting on him and as Isaiah says, they pulled hair out of his beard. As he's doing, as they're doing that, he's praying what? Father, forgive them for they Know not what they do. He loved his neighbor. 
And he demonstrated what that means. There was no exclusion to that list. There was no third column. So let's think about that. As we get inside with the mirror of God's word, and it's uncomfortable at times, say, Lord, I don't want any third list. I want to love my neighbor as myself, just like Jesus did. And if you're outside of Christ right now, I hope that you'll think about your relationship with Jesus, that on that cross, he shed his blood to cover your sins. And if you come in faith, you confess his name before men, and you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you can be free of that and start a relationship with him today. And I hope that you'll think about those things. and Come forward as we stand and sing.